when she passed away, we really reflected on kind of that month we had in the NICU with her and those moments and the few times that we could hold her, how special that was. We could, you know, share these amazing books, these amazing stories, those amazing pieces of the outside world to bring them into the hospital. Even though it was just a short period of time, it, it meant a lot to us. And from there, that's when Norris Nook was thought of. Welcome to 10.5, the official podcast of the OPP Association. My name is Scott Mills. And I'm Emily Brown, and we're the Strategic Communications Coordinators for the OPP Association. And your host for the 10.5 podcast, the official podcast of the OPP Association. The OPP Association is the sole bargaining agent for the close to 10,000 members of the Ontario Provincial Police in Canada. Our members are our focus and our strength. We aim to provide important information to our members and to the public about matters that affect policing in the province of Ontario. And today we welcome a very special guest, uh, Ontario Provincial Police, Provincial Constable Alana Dirtnell. Uh, is from the Southern Georgian Bay Detachment. And uh, we're going to be talking about Nora's Nook primarily, um, which is a collection of children's books currently in two locations, uh, the neonatal intensive care unit at Royal Victoria Regional Health Center in Barrie and Wyville Public School, where Alana grew up. And uh, the nooks, as they're called, contained uh, donated books in memory um, of Elena and her spouse's one-month-old daughter, Nora, who died in 2018. So we're very happy to have you here, Elena. A warm welcome uh, from the OPP Association comms teams here, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. We'll sort of jump right into it, Alana. First of all, thank you and your spouse for all you do for helping parents in, you know, to say they're trying times would be an understatement, really. Um, I, I've read about and become aware of many of your efforts um, supporting the community, and uh, it, it's really, truly admirable. That really means a lot to me. Thank you. I appreciate that. This could be a tough topic uh, for, for a lot of people. <laughs> you know, it was even tough for me to write this out. I, was, I kept... Uh, I just kept uh, kind of getting emotional about it. So uh, I, I just really um, feel that you're doing such amazing stuff here. And so I can't wait to talk about it here. So can can you explain to us, in your own words, uh, what Nora's Nook is? Absolutely. So my family first created Nora's Nook in honor of our daughter, Nora James, uh, who passed away a month after she was born at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. And, you know, during the month that we had with her there, there were so many challenges with, you know, being a new parent. This was our first baby. Um, so much going on all at once. And you're just trying to figure everything out and hold so much hope for your child. Uh, we had her early in an emergency C-section and she had surgeries starting from two days old after birth. So uh, it was quite hectic, a lot going on. And, you know, we, we weren't allowed to even hold her for a while because of her breathing tubes, the IV lines, just everything going on. The one thing that we could do, though, was we could read to her. So every day my spouse and I read Nora easily 20 books, minimum 20 books. Wow. And it was something, you know, normal, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, that we could do with our daughter on those rough days. And you could just tell that she loved it. Her eyes would be so engaged when we're reading and she knew our voices, got to know our voices. And we knew that because every time we'd go and set up in the NICU, she'd turn her head whenever we started talking, whenever we started reading. So it was just so important to read to her every day. When she passed away, we really reflected on kind of that month we had in the NICU with her and those moments and the few times that we could hold her, how special that was. 
we could, you know, share these amazing books, these amazing stories, those amazing pieces of that outside world to bring them into the hospital. It, even though it was just a short period of time, it, it meant a lot to us. And from there, that's when Nora's Nook was thought of. We, we wanted to create, you know, a book nook to offer other NICU parents the chance to have something normal to do with their newborn child and to ensure that no matter what happens, that every parent can have, you know, at least those special moments with their child. Um, Because you really don't know how many special moments you're going to have. So if we can give more parents the opportunity to have, you know, this this little piece of normalcy in a really hard time, then I want to be able to give other parents that opportunity. And, um, you know, I shared this with my mom, you know, Nora, Nora's uh, grandmom, and she knew of a member of the REH Hospital Foundation and reached out to her with, you know, our idea of creating this Nora's Nook and, and they jumped right on it. And so we started building the Nook to look we wanted it to to be girly. We we build it to, you know, Nora has two moms, and then you have a little girl. It's got to be girly, <laughs> and so we built it to look like a dollhouse. It was all white with um, the a light pink roof on it, um, and that was really important to us. That we used the same paint that we used to paint Nora's room. So all of the nooks actually have a part of Nora's room in them. It's the same paint from the same can. And then we got a plaque made basically to to just put on it. So they kind of, every family knew why the Nook was there and that it was to honor her. And honestly, to make parents understand that they're, they're not alone in their fight and their struggles and the situations that they're going through at the NICU, that they'll never be alone, that there's always so many other parents out there that, have gone through a similar experience and can feel their pain and know know how hard it is and that this little book nook hopefully will, you know, help them again goes back to that normal C piece of of just something for them to to be able to do. And then I don't know, we I'm pretty proud to say that we've expanded it. So it started at RVH and we actually just dropped off a bunch of brand new books for her birthday. Her birthday was last month. And we have a second location at Wyville School. And that was put into the school last year because she would have started junior kindergarten last year. And then kind of our future goals for the Nook is just basically keep refreshing the books, keep them current, keep them fun, um, bring those pieces of imaginary worlds the real worlds back into the hospital to share with your kids and hopefully one day we can get one into sick kids hospital um since that's where we stayed that's kind of our long-term goal well i think i might have a a lead for you there uh oh yeah (laughs) yeah yeah in my toronto police days uh uh, you and I are going to have to talk about that. We we did uh, quite a bit of stuff there. Uh, and, oh, cool. Uh, I think I might know the right person for you to talk to. <laughs> All right. Send them my way. <laughs> <laughs> See, good things happen on this podcast. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so, Alana, when you started the Nook, was it um, – was it because you noticed that the the NICU was lacking having books available to read and so you sort of wanted to implement that? Yeah, so the NICU, there's, it's, I don't know if you've ever been in one, but it's, it's so small, you're, you're basically given this designated square that you have to stay in. And it's so small. Um, My spouse and I could barely fit in the square at the same time, um, just because of all the wires and systems and the machines take up the majority of the space. But you have to stay contained to that square. And so everything you bring into the NICU, it stays there because, you know, you don't want to risk contamination or anything like that uh, with such vulnerable babies. And because of the situation we were in, you know, everything happened so fast. We were we were put in an ambulance uh, in Midland and sent to Toronto and then she's being delivered. And then we're being told we're we're now living at the Ronald McDonald house and. 
um, that she's in the NICU and that she'll be there. We were told till October. Um, she was born in August. And so you don't have anything. So a lot of these parents, they come, they go to the Ronald McDonald house and they don't, they don't bring stuff. Mm -hmm. And so you now have all these additional expenses of, okay, I now have to live in a city that I don't live in. I have to get food. I have to make sure I have food. I have to make sure that I'm there for my kid because she needs me. And you don't think to bring all these things with you. So we would always be running down. Luckily, you know, sick kids is in Toronto. So there's lots of bookstores around. So we would run out, buy as many books as possible. Again, another expense, bring them up into the room, keep them there and then read to her each day. So we wanted to be able to put a nook directly in the NICU to one, make sure that with everything these parents are going through, they don't need these additional costs. Um, luckily I had a detachment. I worked in Aurelia at the time that they, they fundraised for me. They, uh, sent me some money so that I could purchase all these books. That's not the situation for everybody. So if we could, you know, have n these Nora's Nooks in each NICU and give these parents, you know, an affordable way of doing an everyday activity with their baby, I want to be able to do that. Absolutely. Now, is this, is Nora's Nook something that you see expanding to, is that your hope for it to expand to other uh, hospitals in Ontario? Yeah, I'd like to see a NICU, like realistically, huge vision would be if there's a Nora's Nook in every NICU, that would be amazing because I know it's something that's needed and that it's helpful. And we've got so much positive feedback from people who have been to the NICU since. Um, so yeah, I need to help. <laughs> and do you, are you uh, collecting books, children's books from people? Yeah, I, um, so we collect the books all year. We also specifically send out messaging around her birthday uh, August 19th and we host like a little birthday party kind of thing with close family and friends every year on her birthday so that we're doing something um, positive and happy in memory of her and that's usually when we collect the majority of her books is on her birthday. If, if somebody's listening and they're interested in helping out uh, is there a way for them to to connect? They can, yes. Uh, if they want to um, connect with me directly, they can get a hold of the Southern Georgian Bay OPP detachment um, and I'll give them a call or can provide my email. Well, that's very impressive for sure. Um, so as mentioned earlier, you're beyond this. You're also <laughs> very involved in the community. And I'd like to ask you about a few other initiatives. So can you tell us a little bit about the local Road Act Club that you're a founding member of in Midland? I'd love to. Uh, so I'm a founding member of North Simcoe Road Act. We founded the club in 2017. And basically, we just noticed that there were a lot of young adults returning back to their hometowns that were looking to give back to the community that, you know, they grew up in. And all of us were kind of people that we lived the small town life. We went to post-secondary. We graduated. We moved to a city. And then at some point, we found our way back to our small town roots. And we kind of wanted to see, okay, who else moved back home? Who else is in this area? And who wants to do something good? So we all met up at a restaurant one evening back in 2017. And that's basically how North Simcoe Rotor Act was formed in Midland. And we focus on service projects that, you know, target some needs that aren't really being met in our community. So because we're a young club, we aim to stick to projects that focus on um, youth, youth mental health, and food poverty. And this year, actually, we're adding a focus onto um, affordable housing initiatives as well to expand it a bit. And basically, our club finds a need that we're passionate about, whatever it is, creates a service project from scratch, and then makes it happen. So I, I don't know. I love our club because we're all passionate about giving back to this community and 
just doing good things for the community. And this, this year, I'm really grateful to be the club's president. So we've got a ton of projects lined up because <laughs> I don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say both of those things you just said, do you ever sleep was one of them. And then, <laughs> Uh, Rarely. <laughs> yeah, then the, the next thing I was going to say is, can you tell us a little bit about what endeavors and projects uh, that you do have coming up? Sure. Uh, so my club actually just finished uh, on Saturday doing a massive back to school food drive for the Georgian Bay Food Network, which is a food bank here in Midland. So yes, that is how I spend my Saturdays doing food drives. And then during that food drive, we had an organization. It's the Youth uh, Wellness Hub here, again, a local partner, come out with students that were kind of short for their volunteer community service hours to set them up for this coming school year. And through that food drive, we just kind of built some community partnerships that way and we're now looking at creating a partnership between us and the hub to arrange pick up and drop off for youth needing to go to food banks because transportation is always difficult in a small town, especially when you can't drive. So that kind of came out of that. And then next up on deck is our dodgeball charity classic, which is happening on October 21st. And it's a dodgeball tournament taking place at the Midland Rec Center for any any kid age 13 and up and we'll give out a free pizza lunch and some fun prizes and basically the goal is that each team that puts in is playing for a different charity that they're picking and if you win the tournament 50 percent of the proceeds then get donated to the charity of the team winner's choice so it's a way to encourage youth to get out get moving but also teaching the importance of giving to others in needs and plus they're picking the charity so they're already playing for something that they're passionate about and we're hoping to keep that passion going for that one in particular we're currently looking for a sponsor for our tournament so if you hear of anyone that wants to get involved mm -hmm. send them my way and of course if you're 13 and older for sure register but that's our next project and then we've got trickery on halloween so that's uh, that's always fun because we kind of go door to door asking for food donations on Halloween since everyone's already answering their doors. So we're not bugging anyone. And we give the houses a heads up usually a week in advance so that uh, they already have the collection at the door ready for us. And I'm actually trying to get my OPP detachment involved with this one as well by collecting donations in the front office and then handing out little kind of safety tip treat bags. Um, I've just got to see if I can get some extra hands. <laughs> but yeah, those are our two next projects that are coming up. And then we have a minimum of one service project per month for my entire term as president. So uh, my team, I know my team's working really hard and we'll be able to do a lot of good this year. You are busy. And I should, <laughs> yeah. I should let our listeners know, too, we were chatting before we started recording, and uh, you also have a son that just started junior kindergarten to add to <laughs> every <else. laughs> Yes. I do. I, you know what? I have my son, Theo, and he, and he just started JK, and then I also have another son, Henry, and he's only one and a half. So oh. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> Uh, so we're not quite done with listing your accomplishments. Um, so I noticed that last month you received the IODE's Ontario Police Community Relations Award and uh, the Ontario Women in Law Enforcement Community Service Award. So congratulations for those. Uh, well deserved. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know what? I was actually incredibly surprised by but really grateful to be recognized. I had no idea that I was even nominated for either of those. So it was definitely surprising. And I uh, actually met the woman involved in the IOD at uh, Central Region a few weeks ago, and they brought me a bunch of new books for Nora's Nook. So that meant even more to me than any award. And, and then OWL is just an amazing experience just to be surrounded by such incredible 
you know, hardworking woman in our field. It it was just, it was a real honor to be on, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Con- huge congratulations, Alana. And, and uh, I know that we got introduced to you through our OPP association, uh, one of our branch presidents, uh, Trevor McKean. And he, yes. he had uh, kind of stumbled across you getting an award and he's like, Hey, I, <laughs> I think you need to talk about this, uh, this police officer here. So, uh, there's, there's a lot of people noticing what you're doing and, and you're making a great uh, difference out there. And thank you for that. So one thing, uh, we like to do, uh, at the end of our, uh, interviews on our podcast sessions is ask our guests about their three wishes for change in the world. And, that can be in the policing world or the world in general. We've got well over 60,000 downloads of this podcast now, over 100 episodes. And we have seen some some changes um, from what was talked about here. So you never know who's listening and who will make something good happen if, we're, if we start <laughs> talking about it. So, um, yeah. Alana, can you share us your, your three wishes? Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's so much pressure. Three. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I love that that's how you end your podcast, though. That's so amazing. So I I can think of three. So my three wishes would be I wish for a world where we can all treat one another with kindness. And I wish that we were all treated as equals. And I wish for a world filled with people that our kids can be proud of. I know, you know, that everything I do, I do for my kids. And I want them to be proud of me. And I want them to learn how to be a good human being and treat everyone fairly, treat everyone with kindness, treat everyone equal. And I want to make sure that they live in a world that's better than the one that I grew up in. So I think if everyone takes those three wishes and does one good, kind thing a day, we can make it happen for our kids. Oh, love it. As Scott said, we're coming to the end of the podcast. Do you have any last words, Alana? Um, if I may, I would like to say that October is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. And why I'm so grateful to be on your podcast today is that you weren't afraid to ask me to talk about my infant loss and my work with Norris Nook. And a lot of people are just because it's such a sensitive topic. So if you're out there listening and you know someone who has gone through a pregnancy or infant loss, don't shy away from the topic. They need you. Um, they need you in their corner. And so ask them about their baby. Because if there's one thing I like to talk about, it's my kids. And I will talk about Nora all day if you let me. So, <laughs> so you did mention that October was Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. And I think that's really important for our listeners out there, as you had mentioned, that, that might need some support. Um, is there anywhere that you could guide them to? There's lots of local supports. Um, some that I know my family has personally used would be Um, The first group that we met is the Pregnancy and Infant Loss, so PALE Network. They have support groups for all families that have experienced any pregnancy or infant loss. And it's a way for parents to connect with other parents who are going through the same experience or similar experience so that, again, you you don't feel alone. There are other people that can relate uh, to your pain. So Pale Network, I'll, I'll always recommend. Another really great organization is Bridget's Bunnies. They do these kits called Comfort Kits, and they're for families that have experienced an, uh, a loss. These kits are located in RVH and a lot of medical centers, local hospitals in Simcoe County, um, as well as a lot of EMS ambulances have them in their back. Um, They also do a yearly Bridget's run. So this year it's on October 21st at the Barry Waterfront and it's for families that have experienced a loss to go and participate in this walk or run um, in memory of their child. The last resource I would recommend using is um, Pillow. It's Pregnancy Infant Loss Outreach of North Simcoe Muskoka. It's another good way for family members to connect with other families and provide 
um, services to assist you with kind of navigating through uh, the loss of your child. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you both taking the time to to talk to me about Norris Nook. It, it meant a lot to me. You're very welcome, Elena. Yeah, you're welcome. It was our pleasure. And thank you for your time coming on the podcast. That's our episode for this week. You've been listening to Constable Elena Dirtnall from the Southern Georgian Bay Detachment talking about Nora's Nook. And that concludes our episode for this week. If you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button on your podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every other Friday morning. On behalf of Scott and myself, it is our pleasure to host the 10-5 podcast. And from everyone here at the OPP Association, thanks for listening and stay safe.